co-host. He is the Admiral, former Berkeley County Commission President Bill Stubblefield. Good morning, Rob. Hot outside, and with my kite in here, it's going to be hot inside. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that is true. When when Height walked in, I had to turn the AC up a lot higher. A lot higher. A lot yeah. higher. You're starting to get a lot warmer in here. Yeah. And, it's a great and, great observation, Admiral. And once a badger got warmed up, it gets even hotter. <laughs> Well, there's some time for that to happen. Yet, let's say good morning to the Sarge, Delegate Michael Heights. Good morning. It's good to be here. Stubblefield firing shots already. I tell you what. <laughs> well, he's an admiral. Yeah, he is. And uh, there will be uh, a couple more folks in studio, too, when we get to the 830 segment. Larry Schultz and John Gilstrap is in for Mike Carl today. will be joining us with Joe Ferretti by telephone as we reunite the Friday 5 in uh, about 20 minutes or so. In the meantime... Uh, we welcome in our first guest of the day. He is the Speaker of the House in West Virginia, Roger Hanshaw. Mr. Speaker, good morning to you, sir. Morning, Rob. Mike, good morning. Help's on the way. Hang on. <laughs> Thank <laughs> he, you, Mr. Speaker. He, he needs it, Roger. He needs it. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go, Mike. The cavalry is on the way, I man. I like it. I like it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, let's see. We, we next get together in August. Is that the next interim session? That is correct. Yeah, okay. Yes. What, what is uh, what is on the agenda for August? Do we know yet, Mr. Speaker? We, we don't. Uh, we're beginning to get that finalized right now, Rob. The way that process normally works is that we ask each of our committee chairs to to drive that. So as you, as you know, the legislature is very much a committee-driven organization, and we look to our committee chairs who actually provide the policy-level leadership for a lot of what we do. So the way that works is that we, we confer with the chairs of our committees who reach out to their actual House members and some of the Senate members in their end of the building to percolate up to the level of an agenda, the, the things that are a priority for them to be working on. So we have we, 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 we usually use these interim sessions to take up sort of the bigger, deeper topics that, that warrant prolonged study over the course of a couple of months that, that then get developed into a bill rather than taking up, per se, a, a bill that uh, like we might normally do during the regular session. So normally we take up things more at the level of, of a topic than at the level of a particular bill. We'll, we'll likely have agendas out in early August. Now, it makes sense from a logical standpoint. The governor is in his final six months. Senate President Craig Blair is in the final six months of his uh, time in office as well. So... To me, the logic dictates that this is their last chance to get things through that they find to be very important and they would need the funding for it. Do you expect some type of push from the governor's office and from Senate President Blair? Well, I don't know that it's a push driven per se any more by them than by us. But where, where we are right now, Rob, is, uh, is we're, we're, we're tracking to end fiscal year 2024 here in about three weeks at the end of uh, end of June with what's projected to be around a $693 million budget surplus. And that's, that's a good thing. That That's that's how we've been able to make the kind of one-time capital investments that we've been discussing, even, even here on this program over the course of the past couple of years. We're really proud of being able to do that. Delegate Height and the team on our finance committee have, have helped us hold the line on spending. And that's, that's put us in a position to be able to end the fiscal year each of the past three years with these kind of surpluses. So I know that there are things that the governor wanted us to do during the regular session that we weren't able to take up because we had to, had to wait and see how a Department of Education issue got resolved. Uh, that has been resolved, as, as you know. I think we've even talked about that. So we're in a position to make capital investments with that $700 million. I'm, I'm confident we'll do some of that. I don't know yet what it will be, but there were things that were important to the governor that we didn't take up. So, for example, one of his proposals was a substantial investment in deferred maintenance and and, and new facility upgrades for our state's hospital systems. So we did that last year with our higher education system. We made We made an investment that gave every college and university in West Virginia a chance to do some facility upgrades and do some deferred maintenance. The governor proposed that we do the same thing with our hospital system. I, I support that. I think it makes sense. The hospital system is part of our overall infrastructure network. So things like that, though, these one-time expenditures, are what I would expect that we would be asked to consider if, if we're, in fact, called to consider those things in August. When is all the information available to be able to calculate whether or not there is a trigger for a state income tax 
cut to be extended? So it, it'll be August. That, that, that'll, that'll be in August. By the end of your interim session in August, will the voters know one way or the other, the taxpayers of West Virginia, if another income tax cut is coming? I, I, my understanding is the answer to that question is yes, but realize it doesn't depend on our interim session. So the process that we put in place when we enacted that income tax cut, Rob, isn't dependent upon any further action by the legislature or by the government. It's an automatic process based upon the state's revenue collections. So it's not as if we have to meet to do a, another cut. It's, a, it's an automatic cut based upon how the state's economy is doing. If that cut is automatic and is implemented, does that affect how much of the surplus you are able to appropriate to certain spending items? Well, it, no, it doesn't affect it. It, it. it would be prospective, not retrospective. So it, it, it would be, the only reason it would affect how much we would be able to allocate or how much we would choose to allocate in an environment like we have today, <clears throat> excuse me, would be if we would just decide to to make make uh, to, to divert money to additional savings, for example. So if we if we the legislature said, you know what, we we are in a, a in the surplus environment right now. We have around a six hundred ninety three million dollar projected surplus. We're going to put even more of that than we normally do into some kind of savings account and keep that for later. We already do we already do that to a substantial degree. But if we decided to do more of it, then that would that would affect how we would choose to allocate the rest. But that would be the only way. Admiral? Yeah, Mr. Speaker, uh, good morning. Uh, we, the West Virginia is blessed with a numerous uh, beautiful old courthouses, beautiful old buildings, that there's not enough money to uh, uh, to maintain them. Governor Tomlin a few years or so ago started a push of trying to renovate or at least maintain these old lovely buildings. Uh, that kind of fizzle, we've not heard anything about it for the last several years. Is there any discussion at all in your deferred, deferred maintenance of getting some dollars into ma uh, maintaining or refurbishing these beautiful buildings? Yeah, courthouses is one of those things that, that we talk about. Of course, so courthouses, state parks, um, some of the, the, the buildings that the state has that are on the National Register of Historic Places, all, all those things are, are we, we agree with you, those are appropriate for the kind of one-time capital expenditures that we're talking about here. That, that conversation does go on. It's good to hear. Another question uh, is uh, the West Virginia University is in the process of looking for a successor for its president. Uh, your name has been mentioned in times past. Is this something that you'd be interested in doing? As president of WV. Well, it's, it's, it's the, that, that's, that's a very important job, Admiral, for sure. Uh, I, I, I mean, I'm an academic at heart. Uh, if, if nominated, I'd certainly consider it. But because the president of WVU is E. Gordon Gee, and I'm 100% behind him for as long as he's well to stay. Delegate Height. Good morning, Mr. Speaker. How are you? I'm well, Mike. Good morning. Good morning. So I'm going to shift gears here a little bit. I want to talk a little bit about um, your your leadership turn team. We usually have, a, I would say, 20 or 30 percent turnover during elections. And over the last two years, um, we've we've had that turnover, but a lot of it is in, in, a, in your leadership team. And when the, the likes of uh, Householder and Espinosa, Hardy, uh, Summers, Fast, Capito, a lot of those were had prominent positions within your team. How do you recover from uh, such a, a deep uh, team and not having them uh, going into next session? Well, we, Mike, as as you and I both know, but as most of our member or most of our listeners may not know, is that really is not all that unusual. So uh, let me let me give you some numbers that illustrate that point. When I was elected to the legislature for the first time, I came in in January of 2015. So I just wrapped up my tenth regular legislative session, and I believe if the number, if I if I'm counting correctly, and if I if I properly uh, properly identified everybody's tenure of service in the House, the number of people who are still in the House, who were in the House when I came in 2015, is now 17. Wow. So we've had we've had an 83% turnover in that 10-year period. So a lot, of, a lot of folks seem to think that, that when folks are elected to the legislature that it's a, you know, a quasi-lifetime appointment, that when folks, when folks come to the Capitol, they, they serve for 20 and 30 years. 
that's that's never actually been the case, and it's certainly not been the case during the time that you and I have been serving, Mike. It's, it's a fairly normal process for there to be substantial turnover. Now, there's a lot of turnover this year, perhaps maybe more than most, in folks who have been there a long time. So folks like, like Eric Householder, like Paul Espinoza, like Delegate Summers, who was elected the same year that I was. So we'll, we'll, we'll just fill every one of those spots with the quality people that we already have that have been elected to the House. I mean, you're, you're one of them, right? I mean, you, you and I can sit and look around at the people who we serve with, and we can easily see who has naturally gravitated towards positions of leadership, who takes an interest in particular policy areas. And it's, it's not at all hard to fill out a leadership roster once we actually see who's elected come November. It, it's, it's really more the norm than not. Uh, it may not look that way to folks from the outside looking in because often we only look at our own delegate and ask how long our own delegate has served. But realize it turns over pretty quickly. We've all, as I said, it's been 83% since I've been elected. So we'll be fine. So, also talk about uh, the interaction with uh, the Senate, the Senate leadership. There's been there's uh, been some turnover as well. You've had Craig Blair, who's been the Senate president for for a few years now, and um, Charlie Trump, who's been there for a, a long, long time, and both of them are gone. So, how does the interactions between your team in the House and the Senate change, or do they? Well, it, of course, it will. For sure, it will, because the body reinvents itself every time that uh, there's an election. Right. It, even even in our body, every time there's an election, the body reinvents itself. It becomes it becomes a different it becomes a different entity with the infusion of new people. I, I, I did my first term of service as Speaker of the House in, in cooperation with Senate President Mitch Carmichael at the time. So when I became Speaker, I was working with a different Senate President at the time. Then Senator Carmichael, President Carmichael, and I had a great relationship. When, when he moved on into the executive branch, President Blair took over, and he and I just had an extraordinary relationship. We, we've worked very well together and, and, and accomplished some really good things these past, these, these past years working together. I mean, I, I, I take no position whatsoever on how the Senate chooses its leadership. That's for the senators to decide. But I, I, I can tell you for sure we're going to continue doing good work in the House. You and I and our colleagues have got a lot of good stuff that needs to be done for the people of this state. And we'll work with whomever's there. You mentioned, uh, Mike did, about the uh, redu- reduction of uh, leadership uh, positions uh, in terms of those who have left and out of the eastern panhandle. That's been especially remarkable. And most of this is is uh, well, self-terminating. Folks sure. who decided yeah. they were going to leave the House, try to run for Senate, uh, whatever. Uh, in your selections in January, first and foremost, do you have interest in being the speaker again come January of 25? Roger. I do. Uh, I, I think we have a lot of good work ongoing. I have been, been blessed with, uh, with the confidence of the members these last six years. It's been the, the highlight of my professional career to be able to help lead our body. But realize I say help lead our body. It's a collective effort. Our, our organization and the way we've structured it is a member-driven organization. There, there, are, there, there are those out here around the state, perhaps even in the listing area today, Rob, who seem to be of the understanding that the job of Speaker or Senate President is to is to dictate. That's absolutely not the case, and it's certainly not how I choose to run the House, and I hope that my colleagues would agree that, that my, my, my approach to leadership is a collaborative one. It's it's based much more around what's our, what's our collective priority and how do I help us achieve it. Uh, I, I enjoy that role. I enjoy the opportunity to be able to speak on behalf of our 100 members. Uh, that, that includes our 89-member Republican caucus but also our minority party we all bring a voice to that to that house and to that legislature and uh, part of what part of what i do and part of what i enjoy is conveying that voice outside the state of west virginia when we have substantial employers who seek out west virginia as a place to do business who look to our state as a place to come employ our citizens they often will they often will seek out input from us as from the elected leaders on what they might face when they come here, what they might experience as employers, what what we may be thinking in terms of what kind of regulatory or legal environment they could confront when they come here to hire West Virginians. I like being that that voice for us. I like being the person who sits down at the table with those corporate CEOs to say, you'll you'll find no better workforce anywhere in the world than you'll find in West Virginia. You'll find nobody who will be more committed to your success as an entity than the people who live in the Mountain State. That's a role that I have enjoyed these last six years, and I, I will intend to seek it again. 
the Eastern Panhandle leadership that we once had has been thinned tremendously. Obviously, you want to put the best person in place for a position regardless of where they're from, but uh, will that include a, a potential Eastern Panhandle delegates in your leadership? Well, always. I mean, geographic geographic representation is a part of our decision-making process, so we, we look to, to, to diversity of every kind and realize that term takes on a bit of a, of, a, of a nasty connotation these days because it's been politicized. Realize it shouldn't be. Uh, we look at the diversity means just just simply what it sounds like. It, it means getting in diversity of thought, diversity of experience. You know, one of the things that I enjoy talking to our, our members of the Republican caucus about is really how different our state is from region to region. Now, I, I work for a, an entity that has an office in Martinsburg, so I'm in the Eastern Panhandle quite often. I know the area quite well. But many of our members are not. Many of our citizens in West Virginia are not. And if, uh, if, if you don't spend time visiting Martinsburg, if you don't spend time in the Eastern Panhandle, it's difficult to understand the development pressure that you face in that area that's just fundamentally different than I experience living in Clay County, West Virginia. I think I've said on this show before, there's nothing at all unusual about me going two or three weeks without leaving the borders of the state of West Virginia. Well, people in Martinsburg cross the borders of West Virginia two or three times a day and not think twice about it. So that's, that's that, awesome. that diversity matters a lot. And we, we will always look to have geographic representation among the senior leaders of the House. You know, the converse of that is true as well, that, that I know that uh, Delegate Hornby, Delegate Willis, and I, um, last session stayed down for the weekend and did a tour of the southern part of the state and it was very eye-opening for us uh, to see other parts of the the mountain state especially the the southern part of the state and what they're going through and I, I encouraged um, delegates and senators alike uh, to do that get out of your area and explore other parts of West Virginia um, and and see what their problems are and uh, you know build bridges so Along that same, uh, you're, you're exactly right, Mike. Like that that's 100 percent correct. I, I couldn't have said it better myself. And and that that experience matters, and it it manifests itself in the way we vote, and it manifests itself in the bills we consider and why we consider what we do. If 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 you approach your service as a legislator from just the perspective of I'm only doing what's best for me and my community, you you've really misunderstood your job. Because we, we are charged with bettering the state of West Virginia. And sometimes that means, that means doing things that benefit only Martinsburg. But also it means sometimes doing things that benefit only Welch. And we don't do a lot of that, but when the time comes for us to do it, we all, we all hold hands and do it together, and that's important. Along that same theme, Mr. Speaker, uh, we, do, we do have a lot of regional differences, regional needs. Uh, one that comes to the top is locality pay, that we in the Eastern Panhandle are acutely conscious of, of locality pay. Are there other issues that are as regionally identified as what locality pay is? Well, the, the, the most obvious one from, from the perspective of bills that get introduced every year, Admiral, is probably property values. So if we think about, so, so take a very specific example, the homestead exemption, the, the real estate tax exemption, the homestead real estate tax exemption is, is one of the finer examples of the regionality and differences in regional approach that we have here in West Virginia. In, in many parts of West Virginia, $150,000 will buy a very nice home. Uh, that, that's not been true in, in the Eastern Panhandle for quite some time. That's right. Yeah. So Very much. how we how we calculate our homestead exemption and what what the what the allowance ought to be around West Virginia is a is a hotly debated question. It, it, it's introduced every single legislative session. We have proposals to modify how that number is calculated. So it, it we are a state of regions to be to be the the forty first state in size. You wouldn't think that we would have such regional disparity as we do, but we we do definitely have. Let's talk tariffs here. The Biden administration has implemented some against the Chinese, and uh, that allows for some possibilities of domestic production again, possibly in steel. And that makes me think of Cleveland Cliffs and Weirton, Mr. Speaker. Any word on what might benefit Weirton out of these Biden tariffs against the Chinese? 
Yeah, that was a terrible announcement that we heard uh, about about the, the tin mill that operates in, in, in West Virginia. I, I have had the opportunity uh, as, as recently as this week, Rob, to have a conversation with the CEO of Cleveland Cliffs and his senior leadership team about their commitment to keep that facility operating. It's an open question as to how it will operate. Will it continue to be a tin mill? Will it produce other other commodities? I think that the leadership team at Cleveland Cliffs is thinking about this in exactly the right way. They're looking at that facility and the workforce that works there. So let's not discount that. That's a that's a very skilled workforce with an almost unique skill set of 900 men and women who work there. They're looking at that as a corporate asset and asking how do we best extract value out of that asset and still provide an opportunity for the people in Weirton. That message was was loudly and clearly conveyed to us by the CEO and his leadership team this this week in Cleveland. So we're we're going to work with them in some way to to see how we can can keep people working at the Weirton Steel Mill. I don't know yet exactly what the contours of that will be. I'm sure we'll be talking to them over the course of the next couple of weeks about what if any action they're going to ask of us later in the year. But I le- I left I left that conversation very encouraged and uh I, I probably ought to leave there. Fair enough. When you go back in January, uh, what will the numbers be in the in the house? We, we don't really know that till November, I guess. Uh, so I, I keep uh, thinking. Correct. We don't. Yeah. We don't. <laughs> I keep thinking that this is a layup because it's so it's such a Republican state that pretty much anyone who's who's in would be in. So yeah, forget that. I'm six months ahead of myself. My apologies. Uh, a final word is yours, Mr. Speaker. I know you have to go. You've got a minute. If you have anything else you'd like to tell us. Well, it, it's, it's a great day to be a West Virginian, Rob. I, I'm, I'm going to say that every time we talk. There's a lot of wonderful things going on in our state right now, and every listener has a lot to be proud of about being a West Virginian. We're going to wrap up another fiscal year here in, in just a little over two weeks' time, $700 million in the black. I'm proud of that. Alex Heights proud of that. We're all proud of that because it lets us make some historic investments in our state, in our infrastructure, in our capital assets that, 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 have, been, that have been a generation in coming. And we've only been able to do that because people have given us their support, given us the opportunity to continue to serve. I am, uh, I'm thankful for the trust people have placed in us, and I hope you'll continue. I hope, I hope everyone listening will continue to do it. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We appreciate your time this morning. Okay. Guys, have a great weekend. You Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Speaker of the House, uh, Delegate Roger Hanshaw.